Uh, my name is Drew Glassbrenner, KO4MA, and uh, I'm Vice President of Operations for AMSAT. And uh, if some of this looks familiar, uh, I borrowed heavily from uh, Jerry Buxton, our Vice President of Engineering's uh, presentation from Dayton this year. So if you see something about coming by the Dayton booth or something like that, just act like you didn't see it. So I've got a lot of slides today and uh, some some very, very exciting information at the end. So uh, I may uh, power through some of these real quick. If you got a question, uh, just stick your hand up and, and we'll stop and back up if we need to. We got a lot going on at AMSAT NA now. Uh, after uh, kind of a, a period of uh, not doing a whole lot, we've got, uh, can you believe it, five Fox satellites in production. Uh, it, they are truly cheaper by the dozen. <laughs> And, and I really, uh, Graham, I've got to say, uh, I, I find it very humorous that uh, our first four CubeSats were FM. Your four, first four satellites are transponders, and now both for the fifth, we've switched. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Fox 1A, or 1, became Fox 1A when we decided to build a bunch more. Uh, this satellite is a 1U CubeSat. Uh, it's been in production and, and design and production for quite a while now. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, uh, we've got two hosted experiments on board it. We have a uh, Penn State Erie has a MEMS gyro experiment that's actually built into the IHU. And uh, Vanderbilt has a radiation experiment that we're carrying. This is very important because this got us our launch on the NASA ILANA program. Fox 1 has been environmentally tested. Uh, you can see here, this is with the antennas extended, the two meter whip and the 70 centimeter whip. This is mounted to the vibe table. Man, that thing's big. Uh, this is uh, more mounting on, or this is actually in the thermal vac. This is in the thermal vac testing. Bob Davis, Lou McFadden, uh, I think that's Burns, and I can't tell who that is. Uh, so it's been through vibration and thermal vac, and here's uh, all the excited engineers when we fired it up afterwards and it still worked. It was delivered and integrated into the P-Pod for launch on March 25th. Uh, we are in the bottom of our P-Pod, the first one in, last one out. Uh, the P-Pod was integrated into what's called the NPS Cool. Uh, the Naval Postgraduate School CubeSat Launcher, which is this big cluster. And you can see there are eight CubeSat P-Pods in here with three satellites each, or three U of capacity each. Uh, we're in this one here with Bison Sat and ARC-1. Uh, it's been delivered uh, to the launch vehicle. And right now the launch is, has been moved to late September. We can't give the exact date, but it's late September. Fox 1B, unfortunately 1B is not going to be the second one launched. Uh, 1B also carries the Vanderbilt uh, radiation experiment. Uh, 1B will be called Rad Effect Sat. Uh, technically this will be Vanderbilt's spacecraft, uh, but internally we call it 1B. Uh, it's uh, right now listed for consideration for a July 2016 launch to a sun synchronous orbit. Uh, the actual selection hasn't been made yet. We're on a priority list, and it depends on who comes back and says we're ready, and yes, we want that orbit. But uh, I think we're looking good for July. Fox 1C. 1C is kind of my puppy. Uh, <laughs> we, we, uh, we decided to go after, we were seeing some delays in some of the Ilana launches, so we decided to go after a paid launch for this. Uh, so we, uh, We've worked with uh, Space Flight Services, or just Space Flight now, uh, and we're going to be on their first Sherpa launch in uh, late 2015, late this year, on a SpaceX Falcon 9. Uh, the engineering model for 1C is uh, being built right now, and uh, it'll go into testing, or it's going to environmental testing soon. Again, we're carrying experiments. Uh, we have uh, the Penn State Erie MEMS gyro experiment. It's going to be on every one of them probably because it's built into the computer. Uh, we've also got the Vanderbilt experiment um, and we've got the Virginia Tech camera. Uh, this will be a, a JPEG uh, camera 640 by 480 and oops, I forgot to delete that. Um, 
it'll be sending, uh, sending down pictures upon command, 9600 baud FSK. The uh, Fox Telem program will, will decode them and display them right there on your screen for you. And we had that running at uh, the booth in uh, uh, Dayton, and it works pretty well. Something we added to 1C, uh, since we had a couple of open uh, experiment boards, all the Fox satellites have four extra boards available in them to carry experiments. We had some room left over, so uh, some of us came up with an idea that we'd, uh, we'd fly an L-band receiver. Now, it's not a standalone L-band receiver, but it's a, uh, a down converter. So it takes uh, L-band and downshifts it to uh, 70 centimeters. And that'll be switchable, it'll be one or the other. So since we did expend uh, a considerable chunk of money on Fox 1, uh, on the launch for Fox 1, uh, we've been uh, trying to raise some money in some unconventional ways. If any of you are on any of the AMSAT Facebook groups, you've probably seen this. This is a, a, f a crowdsourcing uh, fundraising apparatus that we've been using. And uh, I'm proud to say we've, uh, we've come up with $17,000 so far via that. Uh, the idea here was to get outside of the normal AMSAT contributions, and we've, we've reached out into the maker community and into the, the other parts of the CubeSat community, and we've had some success with that. Uh, a couple of perks that we're offering for fundraising. Uh, at a $100 donation, we've come up with this uh, challenge coin. That's a quarter. Um, the challenge coin is a, a tradition in the U.S. that came out of the military. And uh, it uh, actually works out, it's about one inch on a side, so it's a quarter scale model of the satellite. And we give those for $100 donations. And uh, there's been several people in this room that have done that, and I thank you. Uh, we're also, uh, the solar panel covers for Fox 1C, we've done this for Fox 1A. So the, the Lexan covers, when we're done with them, we'll take them off and scribe them and mount them on a plaque, and that's for a $1,000 donation. So. Got to uh, raise the money where we can when we're paying for a launch like that. 1D. 1D is the flight spare for the 1C launch. If we break 1C during testing, <laughs> then we'll fly 1D. It, it's basically identical except for one experiment. Uh, if it's not used, we'll turn it around and submit it for an Alana launch, or we'll have it on standby for any last minute opportunities. Uh, it uh, seems like there's always a CubeSat failing to, to make delivery for a launch. So uh, if we can slide in there at the last minute, uh, all the better for us. We've got uh, the same uh, Penn State experiment. We've got a University of Iowa High Energy Radiation CubeSat instrument, a.k.a. Herky. And that's a recreation of the original Van Allen flights uh, with an updated set of components. We've also got the Virginia Tech camera and also the downshifter, the, the L-band down converter for the uplink. Fox 1E. We had an opportunity come in via one of our, uh, one of our AMSAT friends uh, for a launch in 2016. We decided to do a little different. Plus, we were starting to run out of parts. So uh, <laughs> we decided we'd put a, uh, a Mode J transponder in this, two meters up, 70 centimeters down. 30 kilohertz seemed like a good round number. Filters are easy to find. Uh, so we uh, made it 30 kilohertz wide. We really, I'm a really big fan of the 1200 baud BPSK. So I gotta say we, we, we borrowed that. <laughs> Stole something. Uh, w <laughs> one thing that we're going to try on this is uh, uh, sort of a store and forward APRS system. Uh, we're gonna listen on the APRS frequency and collect APRS messages of a certain format as of yet undetermined. But basically there'll have to be some, something in there that makes that message different to get it collected. And then uh, rebroadcast that on the BPSK downlink at some point later in time. And the idea here is if you have an APRS buoy or boat or, or Graham or somebody's floating off in the ocean with his APRS running uh, and he's outside of the footprint the satellite will catch it and then downlink it later and can be fed into the network. Uh, so basically we're using parts and scraps and leftovers from uh, the first four for this. And there's no guarantee on this. It, it's all hanging on the launch opportunity. 
Also, if we get it built and it's ready to go, it'll be ready to go at, at a moment's notice. I do not know that. Uh, I wasn't aware of that. I'll uh, take a look at it. Maybe you can give me an idea where to look for it. Yes, there's a website and we have an application and also. So I include the suggestion that you use the same format for this mission. That's a good idea. I'll look into that. Thank you. Let's let's talk afterwards and yeah. I'll get the I'm specifics. Right there, right there. Okay. Question. Great. Uh, Something that we started this year is uh, basically an AMSAT Skunk Works. This is something that Tom Clark came up with. Skunk Works is something that came out of, I guess, Lockheed, where you, you, you put all your smart people together and see what they can come up with. Uh, so the board of directors uh, approved some seed money for it, and it's operating under the engineering team. ASCENT stands for Advanced Satellite Communications and Exploration of New Technology. Basically, this is R&D for opportunities that may come up, and uh, Tom is heavily involved in that. One of the things they're working on is the CubeQuest Challenge. This is a uh, competition that NASA is sponsoring for uh, deep space CubeSat missions. We've teamed with Ragnarok Industries, which is a startup nanosatellite company. And we're providing uh, communications and navigation uh, consulting and, and package for them. Uh, there's a series of competitions, design competitions, uh, called the Lunar Derby. And eventually this will lead to the top contestants getting launched on the SLS-1 mission uh, and ending up flying by the moon and if they've got their stuff together going into orbit around the moon. Uh, we're looking at a 10 gigahertz downlink on this, and there's a good possibility that when they're done with it, uh, it'll be turned over as an amateur radio satellite. The Ascent Group is also looking at opportunities to HEO, uh, probably with a 6U satellite, 6U CubeSat satellite to either GTO or HEO. Uh, this is uh, working along with the CubeQuest Challenge. Again, we're looking at the same set of frequencies here, 5 gigahertz up, 10 gigahertz down, and looking at something that could be used with a one meter dish. Also looking at carrying university experiments, and we plan on applying for a uh, CubeSat launch initiative launch there. So this is the exciting one, or an exciting one. Millennium Space Systems, uh, got together with Bob McGuire and 4HY with the Virginia Tech Hume Center. That's Bob's employer now. And they uh, have an opportunity for us to go to a geosynchronous orbit on one of their satellites. It would be a ride share on the U.S. Air Force's wide field of view, WFOV satellite. Uh, it's going to a geosync orbit inclination somewhere between 4 and 8 degrees. It won't be fixed, it won't be completely geosynchronous. It will drift uh, or be moved over the test and mission periods, mostly over the continental U.S., but sometimes it'll be outside continental U.S. And the mission may go for as long as a decade. Again, we're looking at using the same 5 gigahertz uplink and 10 gigahertz downlink frequencies. Uh, we can use, uh, obviously use all the same uh, transmitters, amplifiers, and, and uh, parts. Big part of this is uh, emergency communications capability with portable equipment. Uh, we envision this to be a, a, a small package that can be uh, distributed, brought out when we have our, our uh, hurricanes and tornadoes and wildfires and the things that we're prone to in the West. Uh, this, uh, this will come in handy. Uh, we're also using that as some justification and uh, support for the mission through FEMA. Uh, FEMA is our Federal Emergency Management Association. So we're participating in building the uh, ground station for this and the flight RF hardware, and we will operate the payload once it's in orbit. Here's a picture uh, from a meeting a month or two ago. Uh, that's a uh, 
space frame in the background of the satellite. Uh, you see Phil uh, in the audience here is one of the ones in the picture, but this meeting was held out in California uh, to discuss the mission. It gives you an idea of the size of the satellite. Uh, these slides are uh, borrowed right from Bob, so I'll do the best I can on it. Uh, the uh, idea now is to have both analog and digital capabilities on it. Uh, 5 gig up, 10 gig down. On the analog side, it'll be a few watts output to a horn on the downlink and a, a phased array on the uplink. On the digital side, uh, it'll uh, operate uh, like a trunked radio system, 30 watts into a horn, so quite a bit more power there in the same antenna systems. The idea behind the ground terminal is we're going to keep it low size, weight, and power. Uh, we want to be able to operate it off batteries, uh, but if needed, we can uh, plug it in and uh, get more power out of it. Uh, antenna gain, uh, you know, whatever we need on it. We're probably going to be running two dishes, one uplink, one downlink. Uh, dual band feed where your uplink is half of your downlink is a little difficult, but uh, maybe we'll get it into one. On the digital side, the, uh, the uplink channels, you know, we're not sure. We haven't got into that analysis yet. Uh, but we're assuming a narrow PSK uplink uh, carrying data, so either, you know, voice, uh, picture, email type traffic. Uh, polyphase filter bank on the receiver, and uh, like I said before, operate much like a trunked radio system. Uh, where we can turn on security verification and authorization when we need it, like in one of those emergency type situations. Here's a couple of uh, possible footprints. Now Bob provided these to me. I'm not, don't, I don't think we pay a whole lot of attention to the, the gain rings here, but this is the footprint. It's 74 west. You know, we're, we're into Western Europe, Western Africa entire continental U.S., all of South America, uh, Alaska as it moves to the west, Alaska will come in and Europe will drop out. Get that guy right there. Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, uh, so this is all working with a bunch of partners and on the Air Force side, uh, Bob, Bob's all about connections, so he listed all these, and I think it's, it's good to go through them uh, to know where we're at. Uh, Colonel Fred Kennedy is the lead on the Air Force side. Uh, Jeff Ward was formerly with USAT and SSTL. Tapper and AMSAT, uh, he's now the VP of products at Millennium. Millennium is the integrator for wide field of view. Uh, Colonel Kennedy's not a ham, but hey, <laughs> He was a student of Jeff's, right down the street here. Millennium, it's a small company, about 100 employees. Uh, Stan Dubin is the chairman and CEO. Uh, you might have heard of him through Space Dev. They built Chipsat. Jan King worked for him, former VP of Engineering for AMSAT. And Bob Davis worked for him, who uh, does a lot of our mechanical stuff now. Rincon. Uh, Rincon is providing the radio. They have a uh, professional software defined radio that they're going to donate that's going to be the heart of the mission. Uh, and Mike Parker is the founder, KT7D, and uh, he goes a uh, long, long way back with Tom and Bob. A lot of, a lot of tight connections in here. So the common elements between all these missions. 5 gigahertz uplink, 10 gigahertz downlink, one meter dish. So where are we going with all this? We'll have, to some extent, a common ground station between the CubeSat Challenge, a HEO mission, the geosynchronous mission, and any future opportunities. We'll have common uh, RF, PA, and LNAs and we're gonna let the SDRs do the heavy lifting. And hopefully we can get this into some type of commercial production. Low cost, we wanna keep it under $1,000 for the whole package. 
I'd like to see it a lot less than that. Uh, and you'll be able to use it on multiple satellites. Uh, in the U.S., the direct, direct broadcast satellite dishes are exempt from honor, homeowner association rules and uh, uh, CCNR restrictions. So uh, if you just lie and say it's a TV dish, you can uh, put it up and not get harassed by your neighbor. Uh, I guess if you receive a TV signal on it, it is a TV dish, isn't it? So uh, depending on the orbit for the uh, Millennium Project, uh, you, you might have to steer it a little bit. Uh, these bands are available worldwide. So when it drifts out of the uh, continental U.S. coverage, we may have to work with other AMSAT organizations to run that payload. And other AMSAT organizations and users will be able to uh, take advantage of it. So we've got a lot of things going on. A lot of opportunities have presented themselves over the uh, uh, past several months, and it's been an exciting time. Uh, we're going to continue to partner with uh, LEO projects uh, on a STEM basis. Uh, it's easy. It gets us into LEO orbit. It's a sustaining entry point for new members. Uh, we're still talking to launch providers uh, for all sorts of opportunities. The, the nasty thing about it and the, the plain fact of the matter now is that uh, when I or someone else goes to talk to a launch provider, usually the first thing they send me is an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. So um, uh, from that point on, what we can tell you is tightly controlled. Uh, you know, you won't see any discussion of price or they tell us what launch date we can say, even though you might be able to go on the internet and find out that that's not quite the truth. But uh, that's the way it's going to be. And we're con continuing to work with uh, uh, the CubeSat developers in the U.S. Peter, you want to come up? <laughs> uh, and I, Peter, I, forgive me. I finished this this morning. He hasn't seen the slides. He knows what's in there, though. <laughs> Now for an announcement from an unexpected place. This morning during the breaking news, uh, we mentioned, I mentioned 12 hours, 63 degrees. Uh, I think we all know that orbit. How many times have we, how often have we wanted to go to this orbit? How many spacecraft have we tried to do it with? And what has been the common problem? Have any of them actually made it to that orbit? Well, the engine's been the, the common problem. We've tried, we failed on the first four to hit the exact goal. Peter has, has worked with AMSAT DL for years and years and years, trying again and again. AMSAT NA was forced out of the game for a while. Luckily, we're past most of that uh, with ITAR. Uh, so phase 3E is there, and there has to be a better way. We're real good at making electronics that survive transverse, tra transversing the Van Allen belts twice in orbit. We really don't make rocket motors work too well. Uh, why don't we offer to test something for someone in return for that launch? So uh, in June this year, Bob, as a... Uh, part of his job at VT, approached the U.S. government to launch Phase 3E. We test equipment for them, we fly dosimeters, and we show them how we do things. They said, yeah, we can do that. So in July, Bob came to AMSAT DL and asked if they would give him and VT Phase 3E if the U.S. government says yes in the form of a contract. What did you say, Peter? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not only yes, hell yes. <laughs> uh, we came back and AMSAT NA, of course, we're all in. There's no doubt about that. That's the end. <laughs> That's what happens when you do these in the middle of the night. So, so the idea is, is if, if VT can get the contract, we... Uh, VT, Virginia Tech, will bring Phase 3E to the U.S. 
make some modifications. You, you're probably better versed in this. You want to? Well, I, I look at the wall up there. should be a slight yes up there. <laughs> is it your computer? No, it's no, the no. floor, right? Uh, yeah. uh, let's go all the way to the end. Yeah. Click to exit. Yeah, so, well, we all are very excited about it. When Bob came up first time telling me about this opportunity, it was really, really a big surprise. Okay, this train was not supposed to be there. Okay, this is the one which I want to show. It, what, this, this is our official <laughs> <laughs> the press the release, Amzat NA and Amzat DL and Virginia Tech announced potential phase three launch opportunity. So this was embargoed until I think this time because Bob at the moment, I think he's on the VHF, UHF conference. Bob, Bob is at Central States uh, in Colorado giving the same, a version of the same presentation. So uh, this has been a timed release in the ANS bulletin and yeah. assumingly the MSAT DL exactly. information will go out uh, yeah. all at the same time. So I think the important thing to emphasize here is as exciting as this is, it's an opportunity. Nothing is set in stone yet, but uh, maybe I didn't emphasize it enough. The launch would be directly to that orbit with a perigee that's safe. So there would be no need for no a kick motor. System. Actually, uh, we have, this, we have the, uh, the phase three spacecraft structure and all the components are already in Bochum. Uh, I have not told you before, but some of you may have noticed or heard about it. Uh, just a few months ago, AMSAT DL moved its complete facility, the complete laboratory from Marburg to Bochum inside of the Trentivitara dome. So we have a nice place over there now for doing integration. And we have a small kind of clean room where phase three is sitting now. And when Bob came over uh, earlier this month, uh, he had the chance to, to see actually the, the phase three structure, the spacecraft, the components we are having. And yeah, so as, as Andrew pointed out, uh, we will go directly into the, our supposed uh, orbit. And that means we don't need a propulsion system. And the idea is to remove the propulsion system now, the, to remove the fuel tank and use the space for some other experiments. Probably five and 10 gigahertz if I had to guess. Yeah. I guess so too. <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah, I think there are a lot of opportunity things we will now discuss. But uh, yeah, Bob gave up actually a present. It's not, for some people, it's not a real secret because at our annual meeting earlier this month, we discussed this launch opportunity and uh, what will answer the do. And we, we got the vote from our members. And uh, so, yeah. Uh, the big majority indeed in favor of, of having this opportunity to launch phase three finally. All, I, all mm -hmm. I can say is no other AMSAT community in the world could have <laughs> kept that secret. <laughs> <laughs> we are doing we are good at this. <laughs> so yeah, it's very exciting and uh, yeah, it's a launch opportunity so we still have to work on this but I'm pretty sure Bob will push things very hard and uh, Bob actually was very emotional when he came to Marburg because I think Bob and me, we haven't seen each other for 10, 15 years, also due to ITAR and all this. And uh, I'm really, really happy that uh, especially I'm that NA and I'm that DL getting closer again. I hope we can really come to the point like before ITAR because it was always a very good co uh, cooperation and we achieved a lot together. And so I hope this will be the enabler for future cooperation. And yeah, so we are really overwhelmed, very exciting. And so let's see what will come up.
Yeah, as, as you see here, this will be released in under DNA news, under, under the web webpage. And yeah, we are looking really forward to work together on this project. And we're all very excited. Yeah. Any questions, if, if we can answer them? Yeah. Mr. Heck. Uh, that um, space car, if I have seen in Marco, I think more than once, uh, it's actually quite old. Um, yes. I mean, it's actually finished maybe five, six, eight years ago. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, I think uh, probably more than, yeah, I think well, six, eight exactly years ago, we are, yeah. Or, or scrolls like that. But it must be that some of the, I say must be, is it the fact that some of the components, I think with the battery, mm -hmm. the solar cells, and maybe some of the technology mm -hmm. actually needs refreshing? Or yes, that is literally taken out of use now? Mm -hmm. there, are the there are several components which we can reuse. For example, we have, we have some high power modules, we have command receivers, things like that. There is no much change. This is a very robust design. I think we may reuse part of it. Uh, the the onboard computer, the IHU, is a very old design. It's actually components are even no more available, so there will be a new design for the IHU necessary and a few other components, yes. But most of the stuff, in particular the mechanical stuff, mm -hmm. is there, sure. and this is very the, the most important part. And yeah. So, very yeah, very it's finally yeah. really good to see. Yeah everything going up finally. Because, you know, we talked a lot about over, the, over the, those years how hard it is to, f to discuss now the final launch opportunity, but basically what, what we told before, you need, uh, what, what was Bob's favorite? Uh, <laughs> I edited it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's out. Uh, uh, low friends in high places. Yeah, low friends <laughs> in high places. And, and this is really the case. And these are the space cowboys. And can far hardly find them. And, and for example, uh, we had a lot of discussion with Ariane Spass, with Lisa. Okay, with, with those space cowboys, it was easy when they say, okay, we launched that thing, it's fine, but now you have a lot of bean counters. It's a business now, and it's really hard uh, if you want to launch something in a, yeah. <laughs> where you cannot afford to, to pay the full price. You, you need someone who says, we do that. Very similar to the P4A from Qatar, where the high position man in Qatar says, we want to do this. We, we run into the same situation with commercial launch providers in the US. People are constantly saying, why don't we approach them for a launch? They're businessmen. Yeah, and exactly. These are no space cowboys anymore. Yeah, they're, they're, they're there to make a profit, and yeah. an AMSAT payload's not a profit. Any other questions? Uh oh. And I fully approve, of course, of everything you've said. Uh, but he, he's gone off for breakfast now. But uh, he comments that um, you, you should get a definite go ahead on this project by October or sometime during October. So it's not long to wait to have a degree more certainty. You, you, you can all fill out your membership applications in the meantime. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. We need your support. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Hi, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Any, I love you. <laughs> 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 All right, that's it. Excellent news. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.